Hey, welcome to the podcast, The Upland Nation. That's where we all reside, and that's the name of the podcast as well. I'm Scott Linden, your host, also host of the television series Wing Shooting USA. I hope you'll watch that. We've got a great guest in store for you in just a moment. John Holcomb is a doctor of veterinary medicine, also a columnist for Gundog Magazine, an all-around good guy. So uh, if you have some questions, I'll probably cover them because this is one of the things I love to talk about. I also like to talk about public access, and we'll give you a tip on where to go next season if you're looking for a place that won't cost you any money. But we'll take an investment of boot leather. We'll have some hunting strategy and dog handling tips and a quiz and a prize trivia kind of question. So stick around. The Upland Nation podcast is right around the corner. First, a very brief thank you to the folks who make it possible. Sageandbreaker.com is our first sponsor. They make the highest quality heirloom quality gun cleaning and gun care products and accessories i'm particularly smitten by two things first is free shipping woohoo the second is their gun mat now fred bohm has really defined gun mats for you this is a roll up you know i gotta i gotta use the term once at least and that is it looks like it's made by one of those really old school high quality place well they're new school but sage and breaker has Taking a leaf from the book of folks like Filson made their gun mat out of uh, waxed cotton and leather. It all rolls up and it looks good even it's w- when it's just sitting there. If you'd like to learn more about all of their stuff and how to use it, they've got some great videos. It's all at sageandbreaker.com. Tell them I sent you, sageandbreaker.com. And welcome to our new sponsor, ESPAmerica.com. Yeah, if you're having a little trouble listening today, it may be your hearing. If you'd like to learn more about protecting that hearing electronically, digitally, in a waterproof manner, go to ESPAmerica.com. Now, as they say, without further ado, let's pick up the phone and talk with John Holcomb. John, are you there for us? Yes. I am, Scott. Good, and you're sounding loud and clear. Tell us about your practice, where you are, and uh, then let's just jump right in. Sure. Um, I've got two doctors here in Winterset, Iowa. Um, It's a mixed animal practice, so we do do cattle work and uh, horses and pigs and goats and sheep as well as dogs and cats. Um, I even worked on a duck the other day, so that was... uh, a little bit uncommon, but um, but yeah, we got a mixed animal practice. I enjoy the mixture. Um, I don't, you know, some seasonally sometimes we do all of one thing or all of another at times, and uh, and I sure enjoy breaking it up. Um, it keeps things pretty fresh, and there's always new things to be learning and stuff. And so it's our job just doesn't it's not boring and uh it would hard be hard to imagine it ever getting boring and um that's probably why you can last a while in it that's for sure so oh i'll bet Uh, that way yeah some real challenges especially like you say if you have to put on the long gloves and work on a cow's back end for a while then come back and handle a duck or in our case, a uh, hunting dog, and we're going to talk more about that, too. You kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's a family affair. Uh, you uh, took over a column in Gundog Magazine that had been written for quite a while by somebody you know extremely well. Uh, how was that transition, and uh, what what made you decide that that was a good idea? Um, I, You know, it just was a natural fit, I think, you know, when the, the transition came. I mean, I... Um, my dad had, uh, kind of been retired for a little while and I figured eventually he was going to want to phase out of that part of things and, you know, not be responsible for anything. And, uh, and so that happened and I was lucky enough that the editors wanted me to take over for him when the time came. And, um, it's kind of funny cause back in the eighties as a little kid, I used to mow the yard for him there at the original gundog office in Adel and and was there you know for 
when Dave started everything off and uh, and stuff, and so now it's a long ways down the road here. Well, it's it's Four that, years later, just about. That's kind of a neat story. Uh, not a lot of people uh, remember when Dave started the magazine, but uh, boy, do we have a lot to thank him for. And then over the years, uh, so many others have, have have stepped in and taken over bits and pieces and the whole thing for that matter. And uh, here we yeah. are, coming full circle, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. It's a neat magazine, a neat niche, and uh, obviously you and I and everybody listening to this love love our bird dogs and love hunting and and uh so it's yeah it's so easy to talk about those things um and you know i've sure got my opinions that might be different than somebody else's and that's fine too and um uh but yeah it's i'm really in a lucky spot that's for sure well uh you mentioned a topic near and dear to my heart bird dogs and um you deal with them on a regular basis over there and you you also deal with a whole bunch of questions in your gun dog magazine column. And so let, let's start with, uh, with the top line of all of the challenges, health, health and first aid challenges, if you will, that you deal with, um, with bird dogs, what's the most common one? Well, <laughs> I guess one thing that, um, the thing that jumps out to me is uh, our lack at times of preparing dogs preseason, getting them in shape, you know, getting their feet toughened up, getting the fat off of them, getting them in condition to really to work at their best. And that's where, and I've been guilty of it at times, um, but, you know, not all of our dogs, you know, some dogs naturally just stay in great shape, it seems like. Um, but too often we just, you know, let the summer kind of get away from us and uh and we've got a dog that's not ready to go and so then you have a setback because they're too heavy or their feet aren't tough enough or you know aerobically they're not in good condition and so you know they hurt themselves um metabolically or musculoskeletally those you know first weekends and stuff and um and then they're coming back from that. So that's one thing that I, and we kind of revisit that a lot in the column. Um, but, you know, we should feed them right. We should get them in shape ahead of time. And, and you just can't fake that. You know, you just, there's no substitute for it. It just takes time and way ahead of time. I mean, you've got to do things, let the dog recover, do some more, let them recover. You can't do it all in one week or anything like that. And, uh, you know, if you take a big trip and the dog's feet get sore, I mean, there is no, I mean, you can put boots on them, um, but they still aren't going to perform, you know, the way you want them to or the way you expect or know that they can. And so um, that's one thing that I just tend to harp on over and over again is uh, is trying to get them in shape and stuff ahead yeah. of time. Well, speaking of getting in shape, you know, one of the things that uh, we, we debate all the time, and I've got some new gizmos to do it with here, but, you know, if you're, if you're really trying to get your dog in, in good condition, um, you can free run them, you can run them on various surfaces to work on that pad thing, or you can road them in one way or another. Uh, do you have any particular thoughts on, on roading dogs and how would would be uh, the best way if we had limited time, limited abilities to actually get our dog running in the right ways, in the right places? Well, you know, I, with my own dogs, I've used a combination of different things. And we'll probably, um, I actually do a little bit of jogging myself. And so I will run the dogs, you know, just let them run in front of me. And so we may go, you know, whatever five or six miles um and that can get a little annoying <laughs> when you get, when the person gets tired but the thing that it does like on a young dog it's nice i think because the dog gets a connection with you and they start you know they want to be out in front of you but you can make just subtle little comments you know of come or whatever and you know maybe some negative signs 
I was raised a wire hair guy back in the 80s, and so phooey is my no command. And um, and so, you know, if they're, you see a rabbit or you see a deer, you know, you can make that negative um, correction. And, and uh, they, I don't know, it just seems like it really, you can bond with the dog and uh, control them a little bit, unlike them free running out in the field. Um, and so there's an age where that's kind of a nice deal. Um, I like, I'm super lucky that I've got enough ground that I can run my dogs off of four wheeler free. And so I'll, so, you know, when they're running with me on the gravel road, or if you're roading them with a four wheeler, you know, you're going to be at a slower, kind of a slower, more steady than hunting speed. I also happen to like running them hard with the four wheeler, um, and I'm in mean, real hard. I've got pasture ground, and and I've got a couple dogs that are field trial dogs, horseback dogs, and so you know it's a dog race basically at times. And um, running over speed, you know that's another thing. You know, and again, just like athletes, you know there are different levels of intensity, and in that fast speed where I'm kind of pushing them forward. They're not hooked to the four wheeler or anything, you know, but they learn to run to the front with it and they got to run hard and we're going maybe 20 miles an hour over pretty good country, you know, really pushing um, at times in the open spots, but maybe 15 miles an hour, at, you know, and some of the rough stuff, but uh, um and doing that for 20 minutes maybe and that is like soup you know that's a high intensity deal but i guarantee you those dogs find another gear that they can run at um and run a little bit longer and just uh, be pushing more and that doesn't necessarily apply to foot hunters but um but it kind of does because it mixes it up for the dog and i mean it just it makes them in shape in a better way um and uh so those are the things, and then obviously just free running them on mm -hmm. foot is yeah has some skill. And thank goodness for GPS collars. Um, you know that's made life a lot better here over the last however many years they've been out. Well, yeah, don't leave home without one, and don't let your dog leave home without one as well. I am a yeah. big, big believer. You know, you mentioned what I'll call a high speed run versus a trot for a dog. Um, they're also um, uh, developing different types of muscles when they do those different speeds, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they sure are. You know, that that steady trot down the road in a typical roading situation is fine, but, uh, you know, you can blow some cobs loose, you know, and there's another gear for the dog, and um, obviously we don't want them to hunt that fast, but many of these dogs are wound up tight enough that they kind of, you know, enjoy that. Of course, you got to pick a spot, you know, where you're probably not going to run into birds, you know, or things like that. You know, I'm sure not trying to in those situations, but, um, and running off a of four wheeler in open fields, um, it, again, it's a different kind of handle for the dog where they kind of have to pay pretty good attention and, if something's going really wrong, you can get to them fast, mm -hmm. you know, to help make the correction. Um, and again, I'm spoiled because I'm, I just got a good spot that way. Um, but for, you know, and I know people run dogs off bikes on bike trails. Um, I would definitely crash. Um, but that, <laughs> that would be a way for some people to get to a little higher speed, you know, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for that dog. And that, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes is like, that's it. You know, that should be the end of that workout probably. Uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. 15 minutes, about all I can do at high speed on a bike anyway. Um, yeah. Let, let's get down to the nitty gritty. If we're out in the field and we're hunting and we have a dog and we have a hunting vest and we got room to put stuff in the hunting vest. Um, sure. We, we've all got a list of one sort or another, but on top of all that other stuff, that we can get in any number of places. What are some of the things that you think are critical that we may not have thought of ourselves? Oh, well, I hopefully probably have thought of most of these things. I, one 
um, I will talk about some of the things that, that I think about having. And sure, at times I don't have everything I should have with me. You know, it's a lot of it's in the truck still or whatever because uh, of just weight and, and stuff like that. But um, a n somewhat new product, this Vetrison, you may have seen advertised on TV, is, a, is kind of a flush spray, wound spray. And they've got different types for dogs versus horses versus cattle. It's I'm going to generalize and say it's basically all the same thing. Um, I would suggest somebody has one of those bottles with the pump spray or the hand, the trigger type spray, not the push your finger down type where it just kind of missed. But to flush a wound or flush an eye out, that stuff is awesome. It's got the safety level of um, sterile saline, you know, normal saline, so it's safe on anything. Um, but yet it has the disinfectant kind of activities almost of bleach water or something, but yet it's totally tolerable to all tissues. And so, like I said, it's a dual purpose deal. If there's a cut with some weed seeds and dirt in it, you can spray that and blast that stuff out of there. Um, if you want to kind of irrigate an eye for something, you can do the same thing. It would be fine in ears also. And so that Vetricin is is a really nice product that's kind of come on the scene and over the last five to ten years um, that maybe not everybody's doing, you know, yeah. some kind of a light rope, which may be in the leash form to mm -hmm. have as a tourniquet or to help get a trap off. Um, I want some sticky tape so that, you know, you can do anything with that, um, you name it. I want some antibiotic only eye ointment that is typically safe in, you know, any situation. We don't want steroid combination eye ointments if we've got a so often our dog injuries you know there might be a scratch on the cornea or some kind of an injury to the eye and the steroids would delay the healing of that and so um, just an antibiotic only ointment if you've got a good relationship with your hometown vet I think most people would be willing to you know if you say man I'm taking a big trip and I'm going to be gone could I have you know this um, maybe some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, you know, a general antibiotic, maybe even if you're in rattlesnake country, some some Benadryl of some kind that you can get over the counter and uh, maybe some prednisone, a steroid pill. Um, mm -hmm. Also, for medications, um, now the non-steroidals and any of that stuff, you should probably call and ask for advice on what, you know, to do when on those things um well you bring that up and and, and that's been a topic uh for years and it's uh, you know any more what i'm reading is that um that a aspirin of any sort is probably nowhere near as good as it used to be thought um if you're going to have one go-to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to keep in your your kit in the truck for after a hunt for example what are you carrying these days? Well, like the generic carprofen, well, carprofen is the mm -hmm. generic of the original brand name Remedil. Um, that sure got an easy dosing profile. There's four big non-steroidals, um, that carprofen, Prevacox, and Medicam are probably the three most common ones that we're using, and depending on the dog size and stuff, some one can be better than the other. Any non-steroidal may upset the stomach of one dog, and it may be great for another dog, and vice versa. And so you can't pick any of those that, like, one is better than the other unless you've got experience with your own dog. Um, but I like the carprofen is pretty handy and pretty cheap. But you don't want to do that, throw that into them, you know, if the dog's, you know, run its butt off all day and is probably maybe a little dehydrated and stuff really we should get it rehydrated and calm down before we just hit them with a the non-steroidal we want those kidneys working good and getting plenty of blood supply and so you know in an overheating situation don't want to do that um in a just a wore out wrung out long long day you know it's not you don't want to do that at three o'clock in the afternoon maybe at eight or nine after they've kind of settled in and and kind of had time to rehydrate, but 
you don't want to just do that automatically and stuff. Right. Oh. Um, All right. Well, hold that thought because we have a related question coming up from a viewer or listener. I got to get into the swing of things here about that. But sure. before we do, hold on for just a second, uh, Dr. Holcomb, and we'll be right back to you after this brief commercial interlude. Yes, indeed. Uh, if, if it weren't for folks like Dakota 283, we wouldn't have a podcast here at the Upland Nation. I'm grateful to them. Remember meeting Greg Cronkite when he just had a couple different products at Pheasant Fest a few years back. They are great. I love them. I use them. They make crates kennels for some of you, storage devices, including some other neat products. And in fact, they have a chance for you to kind of get something free with every purchase. So write these down, Linden FI and Linden DD. If you buy a G3 kennel from Dakota283.com, you can get a forever insert or a dine-in dash free. The forever insert, it's a patented device that actually breaks your new kennel up into little spots so you can, your puppy can grow along with the size of the kennel. You don't have to buy a whole bunch of other kennels as well. And you can also choose the Dine and Dash instead if you're not buying a puppy anytime soon. Dine and Dash will hold about two and a half gallons of water. It won't spill. It stores that water. You can also store some dog food in there. You can bring your own dog water from home instead of acquainting your dog with questionable water along the way quick note new lower pricing on the dakota 283 kennels of all sorts Uh, so if you're shopping around now's the time start investigating Uh, no free shipping anymore but the net savings to you from the lower prices will make up for it and then some also welcome dogdra electronic training collars They are our newest sponsor, and boy, am I excited about what they're going to be doing in the next few weeks. They are introducing a brand new product. They're calling it the TNB Dual. Yeah, two dogs, one handheld controller, but you don't have to toggle back and forth like some of those other guys require you to do. The Dogtra TNB Dual allows you to handle two dogs with one handheld It can be used for one, and then as you acquire more inventory, you can add another dog and another collar. Lots of other flexibility. Watch for it. I'll give you more information as we get closer to the TNB Duels debut from Dogtra. Now, Dr. Holcomb, you're back in in the office, as it were, for a question from one of our listeners that I think uh, just kind of segues out of your last discussion. Sure. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff on the market these days, and I, I, I hold my veterinarian's feet to the fire whenever new stuff comes out, and I say, what are you using on your dog? And I'm asking you that question on behalf of Thomas Stone, one of our listeners, when it comes to heartworm prevention. What's uh, what's what's the one that you're you're recommending these days? Uh, we use HeartGuard or HeartGuard Plus um, as uh, our main, basically our only product. Um, it's been great for a lot of years. Um, it's so palatable that you know it's virtually guarantees they're going to take it in and and uh, you're going to get the dosing properly. You know we've We've recommended year-round preventative for probably about 20 years now. Um, Obviously, the mosquitoes are not transmitting heartworms when it's out of mosquito season, but the preventative, when we're given heart guard monthly, um, we still are protecting the dog and cleaning them out for roundworms, hookworms, and whipworms in their intestinal tract, and so... uh, those are more common than heartworms, at least in our area and most areas. Um, and so when you do that year round, you just don't have to think too hard about when do I start, when do I stop. It takes some of the human error out of it. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so we like hard guard, and then I like next guard for fleas and ticks, um, which is another chewable product from the makers of hard guard and frontline. And I didn't think anything could be better than frontline, but the next guard is doing a better job than frontline. Well, um, 
you bring up an an interesting point, and we had had this discussion not a not a week ago at my house. So um, both of those are are monthly. So you give your dog a little, Correct. basically a chew treat, and he eats it. Um, is there any sense in spreading out uh, those by two weeks, or can you give them both in the same day? Uh, you know, is there any risk involved in in effect in overdosing a dog with heart guard and next guard at the same day? No, you shouldn't have any kind of a problem that way. Um, the the next guard generation of flea and tick products, and there's um, Trifexis and Comfortis, some others that are in Brevecto or in that same family. They're using the same set of drugs. And um, after the initial launch, um, it looks like, you know, after it got out in the public, that occasionally dogs that may be prone to seizures may have a seizure after one of those doses. And, um, and so sometimes we've got to adjust things because of that. Um, the products are still very good and, and it's hard to sort out, you know, cause and effect on those deals, but it looks like there's probably, um, probably some connection there. And so when we see that, you know, some kind of a negative reaction tied in close to the dosing, um, I would expect it to be those new flea and tick products versus the old product like HardGuard. Um, and then we got to maybe go back up to something like um, Frontline or mm -hmm. uh, the Seresto collars are sure. a pretty good product for fleas and ticks now also. Okay. Um, um, so that's that. Discussion on Facebook quite often revolves around, oh, I always carry a stapler with me in the field. And I've done that over the years, and I got some lessons from a veterinarian in an emergency situation about how to use a stapler. I'm leaning more and more towards super glue instead, but you probably have some strong feelings about both of those, especially versus leave the dang thing alone, clean it out, and bring it to me. What's your thought on that whole kind of field first aid with uh, with lacerations? Well, um, yeah, anything that's like under probably an inch dimension one way or another or both directions, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't matter too much what you do. You can, there are sure things that we can do to speed the process or maybe cover up something temporarily. With staples, staples are going to be a little bit stronger than the super glue. Um, if something is, you know, some, if there's something that you can successfully glue, I might say, you know, you probably didn't need to do anything to it. Um, but we want to help, you know, and we want to intervene and and do things. Um, so with super glue, you don't want to fill a wound with it. You know, you want to just try and run it along the skin edges because the more you put down in there the body has to it's going to eject that whether it's surgical tissue glue or super glue they're still basically the same thing um and so sometimes you'll have a delayed healing because the body's trying to push out some of that stuff that maybe there's too much down deep and so that's the only thing i'd worry about super glue and then obviously be careful around the eyes um with it and staples, um, you know, I don't use a lot of staples. The thing about staples is that um, the skin apposition, it, it's tough to make it perfect. And so if you have thin skin, it'll tend to want to roll down and in, like those edges will roll down and in. And then you got that hair trying to go down into the wound. And then you can have this delayed healing and kind of a yuckiness that takes longer to heal. Um, and that you'd want to have a vet kind of evaluate that. But, um, you know, if it peel back a, you know, a five inch chunk of something, staples and try and just cover and back that normal tissue is sure beneficial. Um, and then I would try and cover that with, you know, gauze. And that was like on the first aid kit, which whether it's in your truck, probably instead of carrying it completely with you all the time. But, uh, you know, some gauze, some no stick like Telfa pads that um, that don't stick to the skin, and then again that sticky tape. I'm a big fan of that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
to cover things. Also, you know, if you're really in the wilderness, then um, maybe a one pound roll of cotton, of roll cotton, and so that you can kind of make a temporary cast if a dog would really injure um, a distal limb, you know, a, towards the end of the limb, um, you can wrap that up tight and make, you know, make a splint out of it. It's going to soak up a lot of water if you get it wet. That's not good. And you also don't want to put that cast type situation. You've got to, when you're trying to stabilize something like that, you got to get way above the injury if there would be a break. Mm -hmm. And so if your cast ends right at the break, it actually makes things worse because it's heavy and dangly and just adding weight which creates more motion versus just having nothing on there. Sometimes doing nothing is is better. Um, and again, if you had a chance to call and say, hey, here's where this thing is, you know, what should I do? Um, that's always a good idea. You know, that, that leads to another question I've had, and I, I've been very lucky. When I got into the bird dog world, uh, I was directed to a very good veterinarian who was also a bird dog guy, and, and he was my guy for, you know, 20-some years, and then he retired. But I could go to him at any given time. In fact, in the middle of the night sometimes, uh, number one, get emergency service. Number two, though, I could ask him all the dumb questions, and I could say, well, well, if I'm going to do this, then how can I do that? And all, I mean, Sure. All the way through to, like I said earlier, getting a, getting a, a lesson in how to use a stapler. Uh, g give us the you know the honest opinion from a practicing veterinarian. How much of that, or you know, when do, when are we becoming a nudge when it comes to that kind of stuff? Well, you can. When you say dumb questions, I'm going to say you know there's not basically there's hardly any dumb questions but how you respond to the answer to the question can be <laughs> maybe dumb or annoying you know if uh if we sit there and take time and give you advice and then you're like yeah no thanks you know that that is kind of annoying but uh you know any question that you're willing to take the advice on i'm definitely glad to give somebody what i think the right answer is and okay. stuff. Um, all right i feel better but, now <laughs> uh, yeah you ask away that's no problem the, Great. the supposedly dumb ones are easy ones hopefully they've got an easy answer so that's always nice okay then here's my first dumb one uh, and it's not but and it's it's very leading but uh, you know at the end of the day or even in the middle of the day sometimes i'll put that dog up on the tailgate and i'll go over him from tail to nose tip and look in between the you know pads and all of that um and i i'm sure you would agree that's a good idea but uh, in that examination what do most of us miss what what are we not looking for or looking at that you end up cleaning up after us for um most of the time you know you're going to catch a lot of st if you make the attempt you're going to catch so much stuff you know the things that we miss are the tears like in the flank area, you know, the skin tears that um, maybe on a long-haired dog that you don't notice. And then, and they, you know, some of those cuts will, they'll kind of seal back up. You know, if you just cut it yeah, and yeah. it'll kind of seal back up for about three days and then it'll break open because it was contaminated and traumatized. And so it wasn't really meant to stick together properly. So it'll break open, you know, three days later and you're like, well, the dog hasn't even been outside, you know, out of its run for two days. How did this happen? You know, it wasn't like that yesterday. Well, it was, you know, it happened days before that, and the body just hid that. And uh, so you see that is something that people miss. And then obviously just injuries to the bottom of the feet. It's hard to see every little crevice in their feet. Obviously, usually the dog gives you, you know, a clue that its foot hurts, but um you know, stuff will happen to toenails that um, you don't sometimes, you know, a toenail will crack or be just a little bit off kilter where it really bothers the dog, but it's hard to tell um, until you just sit there. You know, you feel one toenail, you feel the other one, you go, oh, that one hurts. Um, you know, what's going on there? And you find that. And then stuff in their eyes, man, they'll, they will tolerate junk down in their eyes, especially if they're running. You know, they want to keep rolling. Mm. and they might be kind of squinting a little bit, you know, a little bit sore in that eye, but you don't notice it. And then, you know, the next day it's just red hot and puffy and 
looks bad. And, oh, and um, don't even go that, there. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's bothering me already. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. It, it can get disgusting, and uh, and that's before it gets under that third eyelid, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Anywhere inside the lids, you know, stuff will hide, and and sometimes stuff gets tucked away and it doesn't bother them and then it kind of works its way out and then it bothers them more and so those are things that yeah you can quote unquote miss but man anybody that's trying to look for problems is is doing a great job i'm happy for them to be trying that hard well well you get a lot of questions from uh readers of your gundog magazine column and and i bet um without being unkind, there are uh, a lot of questions that deal with this, the same subject, whatever it is. Uh, what is the most common question you might get from readers? Oh, knee problems. You know, so mm. many dogs, especially on the lab side and Goldens, um, have a torn or partially torn cruciate ligament. And so that's such a classic, you know, such a common um, problem much more common than hip dysplasia type lesions anymore. Um, and so any back leg lameness, you know, we definitely worry about their knee, um, especially on the, like our, you know, our pointing breeds are a lot less likely to be affected that way than the, than the labs and the goldens and stuff. And Why is and, that? Um, confirmation, mm -hmm. you know, the, mm -hmm. a, Maybe you've seen some extremely tall and straight back-legged labs. They would be, the straighter that back leg is, um, the less flex there is in the knee and the hock, the more likely it appears that they're going to hurt their cruciate ligament. Um, and so um, that's, that's that. You mm -hmm. just don't see quite as many. I mean, there are some of these field trial short hairs that are, standing up pretty straight and stuff um, that maybe don't have what I would say is perfect, perfect confirmation, although, you know, I'm super picky that way, um, but uh, but that's the deal, yeah, and the okay. heavier labs, I mean, obviously, just the bulkier, heavier the dog is, the more likely they are to be that way, and then there probably is some genetic lines yeah. on yeah. both sides, labs and goldens, that... Um, are more likely to be affected also. You did not allude to this, but in my own mind, I alluded to it when you started talking about straight legs and straight backs, and that is, um, uh, I guess, the golden question. Uh, if we are going to neuter or spay our dog, and we want to make sure that we're not affecting that dog's uh, physiological development, uh, what's your opinion on when that should take place? Well, for large breed male dogs, we definitely need to consider delaying that, um, you know, to that year of age or to skeletal maturity, um, if possible. Many of our pet owners, um, you know, we go through that discussion with them and most of them don't make it to a year of age because they remember why we started neutering dogs, you know, when they're younger is because they get sometimes annoying, marking stuff, thinking they're dominant, you know, wanting to do some of the, having some of those negative secondary sex characteristics that we aren't big fans of in our pets. And um, so most of the time we end up neutering those dogs, you know, before they're even nine months old. Yeah, but you did and not. it's just a trade. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. You did not say uh, because they're more aggressive and we can work that aggressiveness out by removing testicles. It, do you believe there's any connection between aggression and uh, uh, intact dogs? Well, there are definitely aggressive neutered dogs and intact dogs, both, mm -hmm. um, for sure. And uh, I, yeah, I don't want to say the wrong thing or whatever. I guess I'd. I'm not going to pound my fist a whole lot um, either way there. The, mm -hmm. You know, there are probably more aggressive neutered dogs, but there are more dogs that are neutered, and so that skews things a little bit. But uh, is there something in particular you're thinking about? 
Well, so many people will say, you know, if you would just neuter that dog, he'd, he wouldn't be near as aggressive. And uh, I don't know that there's any science behind any of that. It's it, it, Right. It, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of psychology in there. Common sense suggests it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> common sense would suggest that it would work, and it maybe takes it takes some of the situational aspects out of the aggression. But, um, yeah, it sure doesn't. You know, that those problems usually needed to be fixed at that nine to 10 week old puppy stage Mm -hmm. when uh, they were probably developing and and stuff um, and things like that. So yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pound my fist a lot about that on the females. And I guess the other thing to kind of wrap on that on males is that, you know, you're improving um, obviously the golden studies, um, you know, opened our eyes on a lot of things, but, you know, you're reducing. And so on the male side, I think that there's, you know, that argument applies on the female side. I don't think it applies because of the fact, um, the incidence of mammary tumors and their aggressiveness and how much we reduce those if we spay early or probably do, um, and things like that, and all these things, you know, our percentages, like one of the early discussions on that subject was that um, neutered dogs were twice as likely to get bone tumors or an osteosarcoma versus other dogs. Well, their chances went from a half a percent to one percent. So Mm -hmm. that, you know, you're not saving everything there, um, and you're losing 15% 15% on some other category. And so it's not that simple, you know, it's multi multifactorial and uh, the pendulum, you know, on, on so many subjects, you know, it shouldn't be all this way and all that way. It's probably somewhere in the middle and that's, you know, the on the neutering or not neutering all of a sudden, you know, the pendulum, in my opinion, you know, some people tried to swing it all the way the other way, and that's probably not right either. Um, and so that's, I guess, my story on that. All right, let's get to something of interest to virtually everybody, and that is um, vaccines, vaccination, preventive medicine uh, for bird dogs in particular. Um, your dogs or the dogs that you see on a regular basis and people trust you with your recommendations, what are the must-have vaccinations that we need to provide our dogs with you bet well rabies is the the number one end all be all because of the human health risk and so anything that's you know a pet of any kind has to have rabies vaccination and um we don't fight that fight too much anymore but uh occasionally on some barn cats and stuff like that we might have to with somebody's arm about getting them vaccinated properly but i would hope that all of our dogs are rabies vaccinated and then you know next is the stem for parvo and uh parvo being the you know the big threat to puppies and litters um lepto you know is can be within that stem for parvo vaccination series and i definitely recommend that for all um, of our hunting breeds um and lepto used to be blamed for some of the reactions that we would get. Now those vaccinations are just as smooth as as the distemper parvo components. And um, so there's no excuse really to not vaccinate for lepto anymore. Um, kennel cough is a challenging one. The kennel cough complex, you know, there's several viruses and several bacteria that alone are in combination, any and all of them can cause that sore throat feeling on down to, you know, real pneumonia and big problems when you get into canine influenza. Um, And uh, so we don't get perfect protection from those respiratory vaccines, whether they're in dogs or pigs, cattle or people, we don't get sterile or complete perfect protection. And uh, so you can't expect your kennel cough vaccination or influenza vaccinations to be perfect. The dog still can get a cough and hopefully it's a lot less bad than it was if it was not vaccinated properly. Um, 
Yeah, and I can I can I can relate to that one. We have suffered through two bouts of uh, the one version out here that can't be uh, defeated by the current vaccine. Mm, gotcha. A bacterial version, they tell me, and maybe they're just remembering okay. that I'm a music major and I can't think any further than that about biological <laughs> stuff. But uh, yeah, it is tough. But uh, pardon the interruption. Any any other vaccinations that we definitely must use? Well, if you're in a Lyme, you know, endemic area, you know, if you're grouse hunting up in Wisconsin or Minnesota, you probably better be covered with the vaccination and you better have, you know, perfect flea and tick prevention um, also for yourself and the dog. Um, Where we're specifically at in our county, there is almost no Lyme disease, but yet up by Adele, um, you know, not too far from the old original gun dog headquarters, uh, there's a pocket of Lyme, you know, and several client dogs up there. Um, and so it's interesting how that pocket is there. And I know people are getting exposed to Lyme in the Des Moines area and things like that and other places. Um, the interesting thing that I know about Lyme for our specific area is that, um, you know, since about 98, we've been running the combination heartworm test, which also checks screens for Lyme or lichiosis and anaplasmosis, those three tick-borne diseases. And basically, there's only been one dog out of, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of tests that grew up in this county and never left this county and came up Lyme positive. All the other ones that we have are coming in from outside areas or up by Adel. Um, but most of them have moved in from someplace that's obviously endemic for it. And so in the Midwest here, Minnesota, Wisconsin, northern Illinois, northeast Iowa, um, and then some even from out east that uh, Pennsylvania dogs have come positive. Um, you know, the Ehrlichy, Osis, and Anaplaz tend to be more southern. So the classic there is a, mm-hmm. you know, a shelter dog from Arkansas is going to almost – somewhat likely they're going to be positive for one or both of those deals. But uh, so Lyme vaccine will do if the people are going to an endemic area. Um, And, uh, you know, that covers the the main stuff. The canine influenza, if you're in, you know, the Chicago land area or you're going to Florida or areas where that is really hot, you definitely should vaccinate for it. Um, If you're not going near those hotbeds you know i think it's it's debatable on uh whether we add that on there and of course you know you can't we don't want to give five different injectable vaccinations to a dog all in one day very bad either so that's uh good to know yeah yeah all right well um we're getting towards the end of our session here and i i think it's about time we probably ask the number one question uh Clearly, you're a bird dog guy, and you do hunt, and uh, so do all of us. Uh, I'm always curious to know oh, what you get out of it. What's the thing you enjoy most about hunting with bird dogs? Mm, well, just, you know, seeing them slam on to a, you know, a uh, wild bird point is about as good as it gets, <laughs> you know, and that... Uh, having that perfection then of course that puts pressure on to maybe try and make a shot or something like that you know to kind of complete the deal um it doesn't take a lot of that you know i don't have to shoot a lot of birds or anything anymore um but it's nice to you know to see that that pure perfection or what whatever you judge is pure perfection you know come every once in a while um that's sure awesome and and uh and then i've kind of got off on this on the field trial deal because i my most recent dog has got kind of that kind of run in her and so we've been playing around with that for a few years and that's fun in a different way and i really like riding the horses and you know having a little dog race and uh um those deals don't you know you rarely get perfection there either, but uh, it's it's fun and exciting when it works out. And um, so, yeah, I'd like you know we're 
hunting pheasants and, and quail here in Iowa and uh, do a little bit of kind of smaller water duck hunting and and um, as far as most of the dog work goes that's that covers that. Well, you passed the test. All right. So you're allowed in the club. That sounds good. <laughs> All right. And uh, of course, if you, if you all out there want more information, then you probably ought to subscribe to Gun Dog Magazine and read John's column. He's got some great stuff in there following the footsteps of his father and uh, all sorts of other great writers uh, with the magazine. Uh, we, by the way, we had uh, Rick Van Etten on a couple uh, episodes ago and he was enjoyable and now he's retired. Okay. So, uh, enjoying uh, you know living the life uh john holcomb it's a pleasure to speak with you i'm glad we had the chance appreciate your time everybody else out there if you do have more questions uh don't hesitate to drop me a line scott linden outdoors at gmail.com john it's time to turn you loose to go do veterinary stuff while i complete the rest of this episode and hopefully offer up a little bit more useful information for people thanks for being on Thanks for all you're doing for bird dogs, Scott. Thank you. And indeed, that's what we're all here for, the dogs and putting them out in the field. And that's, uh, speaking of which, that's the next thing we're going to talk about. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, ESPamerica.com. You know, there's a lot of ways to protect your hearing out there, and I urge you to look into all of them. But at one point or another, you want a hearing protection device that is going to help you be a better hunter or a better shooter. And I wear mine both in the field and on the range, ESPamerica.com. One of the coolest things about them is they are basically waterproof. Iridion nano coating technology pre prevents all that moisture from inside your ear to the rain that's coming down in the field. It's all in the ESP America hearing protection line. So get more information at ESPAmerica.com. And final thank you to our newest sponsor, Dogtra. Watch for the new TNB dual collar. One dog's two dogs, no toggling back and forth. It's all right there on the screen. I'm loving mine so far. They will be available to the marketplace very, very soon. So stick around. I'll keep you posted. Okay. As you well know, when I am not hunting on TV, I'm looking for public access and places to go. That's the genesis of our feature called This Land is Your Land. And it is. And there's a lot of it right outside Lewistown, Montana, one of my favorite places. Lewistown is the hotbed for wild bird hunting on public and publicly accessible land. Now, I've shot pheasants, sharptails, Hungarian partridge all in the same day on pieces of ground that are privately owned but enrolled in the state's block management program. The key to hunting in Montana is getting those map books in advance Get the ones for the regions you're going to and follow the directions for the reservation process for block management program. Yeah, there are times when you do have to actually call the landowner. Other times you just show up and sign in in a little booth. One way or the other, you do need to plan ahead. Some of the places, not so good. Other places, really good. It's all a matter of investing in a little bit of fuel for your truck and boot leather as well. Montana, great. Lewistown, Montana, even greater. Watch for my truck. I'll see you out there. Enjoy yourself on the publicly accessible land in the Lewistown, Montana area. Okay, so last week I asked the question, uh, in the field trial world, what does AA signify? Well, Richard Schott is one of the many folks who uh, contributed a correct answer, and he will be taking home a browning knife, a commemorative Quail Forever browning knife. The answer, of course, is all age. So that's, you know, that's the big leagues. All age is the dogs that, well, you hear about at Ames and all the other big field trials. Richard Schott, congratulations. Now it's your turn. Answer the question at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. The question for this week, the English name of a bird that is also known as Bonassa 
Umbellus. Give me the correct answer, and one of you will be taking home a new cookbook. It's called Joe Beef, Surviving the Apocalypse. So if you like to smile while you're dining and cooking, this is the question for you. What is the English name for the bird whose Latin name is Bonasa Umbellus? Well, that'll wrap it up for today here at the Upland Nation podcast. I appreciate your listening. Thank you for your time. I promise not to waste it. If you'd like to talk with me, it's scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening. See you in the field.